Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks a lot for attending the uh, last session of the conference. I know um, everybody's got all that's standing between uh, you and going home or uh, celebrating after the conference, so I uh, salute your dedication. Um, my name is Eric, and uh, I work at Red Hat. And um, my partner here is uh, Inan, uh, works at Google, and uh, we're two of the uh, co-chairs on the uh, SIG Big Data. Uh, we talk about the uh, SIG today. So the basic uh, landscape of the talk, I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, what the SIG is about. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to cover a couple of the uh, longer term engagements we've had over the last couple of years, um, Apache Airflow and Apache Spark. Um, then I'm going to circle back uh, to the SIG and talk a little bit about some of the trajectories and uh, the possible futures. And then uh, you can see at the bottom here, I called it audience dialogue. So um, we are hoping to leave a little bit of extra time to get uh, feedback from you guys about um, possible uh, <clears throat> directions we can take the SIG or uh, new projects. So the, uh, the main function of the SIG um, since 2017 has been to sort of serve as a community resource um, for advising other uh, projects, uh, in our case focusing on you know big data or data science uh, software projects, and just to serve as a reservoir of uh, expertise and help for hel helping these people integrate with Kubernetes. Um, and then in turn, um, our other goal was to uh, you know represent the concerns of these users back to Kubernetes um, in the form of you know driving possible new features or enhancements, um, shepherding uh, PRs, Etc. Um, and uh, the text you see above here is uh, actually <coughs> the exact text I submitted via this PR at the bottom as the uh, official SIG mission. And uh, I'll be circling back to this uh, PR later at the end. Um, there are actually three chairs um, of the SIG currently uh, Anarud Ramanathan, who is currently at Rockset, um, <coughs> myself at Red Hat, and uh, Yinan Lee at Google, and um, the QR code there will actually take you to the uh, Kubernetes community page for our SIG, if you want to visit that. Um, <coughs> so where did the SIG come from? Um, there's actually a prehistory to the SIG, which I'm not particularly familiar with, but uh, uh, early in 2017 it got revived um, in part of the process of creating a new community platform uh, for the purpose of prototyping the uh, Kubernetes scheduler backend uh, on Apache Spark. Um, since then, um, we've actually moved the uh, Kube scheduler backend upstream to Apache Spark community. Um, we've also done some uh, work on HDFS deployments um, inside Kubernetes and also um, helped the Apache Airflow community uh, create operators and executors uh, to work with Kube. Um, we've had a pleasingly diverse uh, community involvement. Um, the above seven companies here are kind of like my unscientific assessment of who's like been most consistent attending. Um, if I've left anybody off, it is only because I want to try and complete the talk on time. Um, so um, I'm going to go into um, the first engagement, which was with Apache Airflow. Um, Airflow has kind of like an opinion about its compute model. It views computation as um, workflows of tasks, um, and each task is allowed to have dependencies. Now, if anybody who comes out of computer science will know that um, the data structure represented that is a directed acyclic graph. Um, and you can see the arcs of the graph are pointing from right to left, um, as is traditional. And um, however, when you actually run it, execution logically proceeds um, from left to right. Um, so <clears throat> anybody also familiar with the uh, Unix make will realize that this is essentially um, Unix make after taking a lot of steroids and doping and such like. Um, <clears throat> so the basic unit of work for Airflow is uh, called an operator. Um, it corresponds to like executing a single command or a function, um, generally associated with a unique task ID. And it is intended to contain all the parameters or other resources it needs 
to execute. Um, operators come in many flavors. Uh, you can literally run a bash command, uh, invoke a Python function, send an HTTP request to a REST endpoint, or execute a SQL query. It comes out of the box with many, many flavors of operator. Um, <clears throat> the Airflow scheduler is the uh, you know, component that's basically tasked with executing a workflow in the proper order. Um, and while it does that, it also tracks the success or failure of each task and reports that back to a user interface. It also keeps track of uh, log, log data and other minutia. Um, it also has a concept of executor. An executor is really nothing but a selection of an environment that will actually run the task. So um, <clears throat> the basic one is literally just executing locally. Um, on a machine. Um, it also has one for executing tasks inside of Mesos and now more recently um, inside of Kubernetes. So <clears throat> the Kubernetes operator or Kubernetes pod operator is, um, I guess in my opinion, the sort of keystone of the integration with Kube. And you can see it contains very common things, common to all operators, like a name, a task ID. Um, but then it also contains fields for a container image and a command to run on that image. Um, and of course, that's basically the core functionality that allows you to run inside of the Kube environment. You can see also that there are other Kubernetes features supported, uh, like labels, uh, secrets, volume mounts, um, so it's got a fairly full-featured, um, you know, set of uh, <coughs> integrations uh, for a typical Kubernetes cluster. Um, and upcoming, there is uh, going to be support for a uh, Airflow Kubernetes operator, and so it's in a sense the fullest possible uh, Kube integration. It actually runs the scheduler and the user interface uh, and the SQL database um, inside of Kubernetes. And so all the components are actually running in Kube and then executing the workflows also inside of uh, the cl same cluster. And I thought I'd also briefly mention that um, a lot of the actual uses of Airflow in the wild involve very large DAGs. Um, they can run into the megabytes and um, a user could have thousands of them. Um, as part of their workflows. And so you're talking about actually large scale data. And um, one of the things that the Airflow community put a lot of uh, effort and design into uh, is supporting different ways to uh, stage these DAGs to make them available to the uh, containers running in Kube you know, in a scalable way. Um, and here are just a few of the ones that you, know, you <coughs> might see yourself running into. And it's also extensible, so you can add your own ways of staging via hooks. Um, so that, that's the engagement we had um, with Airflow. And um, you know, what I gave you is you know, vastly incomplete. And uh, if you're actually interested in Airflow, I encourage you uh, to uh, check out the recording of uh, Daniel Imberman's and uh, <coughs> Barney Sathetherum, Sa I think is his name. Um, I, I may have butchered that, and I apologize. But uh, they gave that talk yesterday, and um, they go into much more detail um, to the, on the airflow on the Kubernetes effort. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to uh, Yinan, who's going to talk about our Apache Spark engagement. So uh, actually, before I start, just want to get a sense like, you know, how many users, like, how many of you are already running Spark on Kubernetes? OK, cool. It's quite a few. OK. Uh, Great. So uh, before like, you know, I dive into the details of uh, running uh, Spark on Kubernetes, I just want to get you know, a sense of what Spark really is. Like, you know, I want to talk about the Spark compute model. Uh, so on a high level, like, you, know, you have a Spark job. You have a bunch of input data to process. Uh, this is a really, really simple example. Like, you, know, you have a bunch of uh, um, array of uh, numbers uh, as the input. And uh, you tell like, you know, Spark uh, how, how many executors I want. Uh, in this example, like, you, know, so you want three ex executors. So the Spark task scheduler will try to like, you know, uh, eventually distribute uh, the, 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 you know, the tasks among these executors. Uh, so um, the driver is in a position to actually manage uh, you know, the executors. Um, 
so saying like so in this perfect example, like you know, each exterior gets three numbers to 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 process. So let's say like you know the compute compute uh, we want to do is really simple. Like you know, just want to do a doubles of uh, the input numbers. So each executor gets three numbers to process. Then you know they generate some output. Uh, this is all um, orchestrated by the driver, uh, which is uh, sort of like you know the master uh, kind of thing. So when you put these things onto a container, um, that's basically how everything works. Now you have like you know the driver and executor executors all running in containers. When these containers run on Kubernetes, they basically just run in pods. So uh, the cluster mode uh, in Spark is basically like, um, so your driver actually runs um, your, uh, so the driver runs uh, your, your main program and you know, is responsible for actually creating uh, executors and managing them and you know, distributing the task to the executors. So um, this is how, you know, basically like uh, the entire flow of what happens when you uh, run the Spark uh, on, uh, in Kubernetes on, 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 in a cluster mode. So the user runs the Spark submit script so what happens like you know, when you give a uh, master URL that starts with KDS, so uh, this is what happened. Like, you know, so the Spark submit script will call the Kubernetes specific submission client. So this submission, submission client will actually try to create a pod spec from initial pod spec, then goes through a bunch of steps to actually configure the pod spec towards you know, the final state. So it might, you know, there might be steps for like you know, mounting volumes or mounting secrets or you know, uh, um, um, doing other kind of things. So basically, you know, so each step modifies uh, the path spec in a certain way. So the, the final result will be sent to the API server, uh, which will, you know, uh, basically works with the scheduler to actually schedule your driver path to run uh, on some node in a cluster. So once the driver starts, it will be requesting executor pods from the API server based on the user's request. Um, so again, like you know, the API server works with the scheduler to actually uh, create and schedule your executor pods to run on some nodes. So once these executor pods start, they will register themselves to the driver. So this happens actually through a fully qualified uh, DNS name uh, for the driver. So um, Basically, uh, what well, the submission client will also create a headless uh, Kubernetes service for the driver, so it you know gives it uh, a FQDN name. Uh, okay, so this is what we have done so far, like you know regarding uh, the Kubernetes scheduler backend for Spark. So we had a, the first release in Spark 2.3 with initial support for cluster mode uh, with you know language binding for Java and Scala. And also with support using remote dependencies on, for example, HTTP servers or, or S3 or HDFS or like, you know, Google Cloud Storage. And uh, we also support limited set of customizations on the, on the pods, on the, on the driver and the exterior pods. For example, you can actually uh, uh, specify uh, environment variables, uh, labels, uh, annotations, those kind of things. Um, so we, uh, in a, in a, actually, so just a month ago, uh, Spark 2.4 was released so this release actually came with like, you know, more feature for the uh, Kubernetes scheduler backend. For example, now you can actually run Python uh, or R um, Spark jobs on, on Kubernetes. And this release also comes with limited client mode support. I will talk about that later, so why I say it's limited. So uh, in Spark 3.0, which will be the next release uh, of Spark, we'll have more features uh, in, in it. Like, you know, so we'll have Kerberos support, so you can actually use uh, uh, H secure HDFS for, for your input or output. Um, and we are also um, adding support for using pod templates to do pod customization. So we won't, that means like, you know, we won't be adding new uh, Spark config options for like, you know, doing uh, uh, Kubernetes pod, uh, pod customizations. So client mode is actually pretty useful for a lot of things. Like you know, you can use client mode to run uh, Spark Shell or Jupyter notebooks, for example. Uh, so we actually support running the drivers, the driver pods. Oh, actually not not pods, like driver both inside and outside of the cluster. So when the driver runs inside the cluster, it will actually be running in a pod. So um, 
when you actually use the client mode, um, there's a few things to take into mind. Like, you know, so the, first of all, if you're running the driver part inside a, uh, if you're running the driver inside the cluster, so when you, uh, so you, the better is that you give, uh, you know, you tell Spark what is the name of your driver part. Uh, so in that case, we actually set up like, you know, garbage class, uh, uh, owner reference on the exceder parts created by the driver. So uh, then this will allow garbage collection to kick in when, you know, when the, when the job is done. So, um, well, or, you know, when, when you actually get rid of the driver pod, so the exeter pods will be deleted uh, by garbage collector. So when you're actually running the driver outside the cluster, it won't be running a pod. So now what you need to do is actually you want to make sure that you have connectivity from your exeter pods running in the cluster to the driver, which is, you know, now outside the cluster. So, um, we don't, like, you know, we're not really opinionated on how people will do connectivity. So um, in this case, it's actually on your hand, like, you know, so if you're running the driver inside the, pod, uh, inside the cluster, you want to have a headless service for your driver. So you have a, a fully qualified DNS name for your driver. So uh, because actually the exeters will be using that FQDN name to connect to the driver. So when you're running your driver outside the cluster, well, it's, you know, it's much more trickier, but um, still, um, you're, you have to make sure that, you know, this connectivity is set up properly so that the exeter pods can actually talk to the driver. Yeah, so this animation basically shows, like, you know, if you have a driver uh, inside a cluster, you want to create a headless service for that uh, so that, you know, the exeter can actually use that to talk to the driver. So Kerberos supports will come in uh, Spark 3.0. So this is really you know, critical for uh, using uh, secure HDFS uh, for input or output. So to use this feature, you actually need two things. One is the uh, Hadoop delegation token. The other is actually a custom Hadoop configuration that works with uh, the way you set up you know, uh, secure HDFS. Uh, so this feature doesn't yet support uh, dedication token renew renewal. That means actually you by default, dedicated token will expire in 24 hours. It means that you have to make sure that your job finish, you know, in 24 hours, because otherwise the dedication token will expire. You won't be able to access your HDFS cluster any, uh, uh, anymore. So um, this, there's actually two ways you can, um, you know, uh, tell Spark what kind of, a, uh, so how to, how to actually uh, get access to a dedication token. One way is you give the Spark sum, uh, submission client a key tab. So the submission client will actually use that key tab to do the logging and then create a secret that carries the dedication token. Or optionally, you can also uh, bypass this. You can just tell Spark, okay, this is actually the secret I want to use, which ha already has the dedication token stored. Well, the same comes for um, Hadoop configuration. So one way is like, you know, so you, you basically set the environment variable Hadoop uh, conf, uh, I was, sorry, I forgot what was the exact name for that, that environment variable. But also oh, it's actually called uh, Hadoop, um, um, oh yeah, so it's actually Hadoop conf, dar, uh, conf dar. So you set an environment variable to a local Hadoop conf uh, directory. So then the submission client will actually use that to read all the config files under that directory and then create a config map to actually store you know, uh, the, uh, the, the Hadoop config and then mount it into the driver and exeter pods. So also optionally, you can actually use your own uh, config map. Like you know, if you already have a config map, map that stores your Hadoop config, so you can also use that. Uh, so in addition to like, the native integration of uh, Spark uh, with Kubernetes, we're also working on this, uh, the so-called Kubernetes operator for Spark. So uh, this is actually like, you know, uh, leveraging an operator pattern um, that was, that's actually becoming really popular these days. So um, basically you will have a CRD and you know, a custom controller that actually runs Spark Summit for you. Um, so you basically you define your application declaratively in a YAML spec, for example. Then you actually just you know, create CRs to trigger Spark submission. So uh, it also like, so, it actually has, you know, um, a richer support for pod customization beyond what Spark currently is able to do. Uh, that is actually done through a uh, mutating webhook. So it also has native cron support for running time-based jobs. 
uh, also like you know, so uh, integration, native in integration with uh, Prometheus for metrics. Uh, you can actually uh, export like you know both application metrics and also driver or executor metrics uh, to Prometheus. Um, yeah, so uh, it also comes with a custom command line too, called uh, which is called Spark Control for uh, doing things like you, know, you can actually use that to do port forwarding really easily. You don't even need to know, know the, the name of the pod. So because actually, so well, Spark Control will will get uh, the driver pod name from the CR the customer resource. Uh, so then we'll be able to actually do pod forwarding for you, for example. So this is like you know, so, uh, a really simple example of one uh, Spark application spec. Okay, so um, in terms of roadmap, like what I just said, uh, so in Spark 2.3, we'll have uh, support for pod templating. Like, you know, so you can actually supply a uh, pod template for the driver or the executor. So you can do things like, you know, uh, like you can set uh, pod affinity or enter affinity, or you can actually use uh, uh, pod uh, security context, for example, so which are not currently supported. Uh, so that means actually we'll no longer add more Spark config options. Well, well the reason is we already have a bunch of, you know, different um, Kubernetes-specific config options. We don't want to add more because that, you know, so what, the more you have, the, the, the more difficult to manage. So uh, dynamic resource allocation is also on the roadmap. Uh, so um, with dynamic resource allocation, you will be able to actually, you know, so Spark will be able to adjust the number of executors at runtime based on the load or the, you know, the amount of tasks. So this also requires uh, the so-called external shuffle service. Um, so we have a new shuffle service design uh, in progress, actually. Uh, so we also to plan to work on you know, um, better support for local application dependencies. Uh, so right now, uh, the way you deal with dependencies is either you you know, you have a custom image that you bake your uh, dependencies in, or you put your dependencies uh, somewhere remotely, like you know, on, on, on S-Ray or, or GCS. So um, what if, like, you know, so you have some dependencies on your local machine, you want to use those, the first thing you have to do, like, you know, you have to stage that somewhere, e either, you know, make it into, the, into your image or put it somewhere. So we want to have, you know, provide better support for these kind of things, so you don't need to worry about, like, you know, the staging at all. Uh, so the other thing is like you know, for Spark streaming, um, driver residence uh, like, or, or is, is really important. So you, uh, you want to make sure that your driver stays up, even though there's like you know, so failure, you, there's restart uh, um, ha being handled. So um, we're also working actually to, uh, with uh, Seek scheduling to um, you know, uh, have better support for scheduling for batch workloads in general, but that also will benefit Spark. Uh, Spark is actually pretty unique in the sense that if you only have resource to run the driver, uh, the, once the driver starts, you don't have any resource to run your executors, but the job will be hunting. So basically the job will not make any progress, but the driver is, be, is there staying. So um, we want to make sure that um, the scheduling can take this into consideration. Like, you know, so you want to make sure that you have enough resource to run at least your driver plus one executor, so you can actually make progress. Um, yeah, so um, if you want to get involved in this project, you can actually uh, check out the code uh, at you know, this official Spark uh, repo, while well, the code will be under resource managers um, slash Kubernetes. And we have you know, documentations on, a, on official Spark site. And uh, Spark, uh, because it's an Apache project, it actually prefers using uh, user and dev mailing list for you know, uh, questions or, or, or uh, general discussions. So we also have, you know, we also use Jira for, for uh, feature requests or bug reports. Um, there's also a, a, a uh, Slack channel for Seek Big Data uh, you can actually check out. Um, so with that, I'm gonna uh, hand over back to Eric. Thanks, Yinan. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I think these two projects have uh, shown an example of a kind of common trajectory I've seen so far, which is that um, once you kind of get over the hump um, and get some pretty good uh, featureful integration with Kube, um, you tend to see like, you know, the discussion move away from um, our SIG meetings and kind of like back upstream. And uh, I've been calling it, you know, graduating, which um, some projects actually have a concept of graduation. There's no formal process of that at all, but uh, 
you know, it's part of the life cycle, and um, I'm actually pleased that it's happening. But it uh, does mean, of course, that uh, we want to keep a sort of pipeline um, of reaching out to uh, new projects. So um, just a couple weeks ago, um, we got a uh, demo of a Flink operator for Kubernetes. And um, this coming Wednesday, uh, Hazelcast is going to be demoing their um, in-memory data grid and uh, JET um, stream processing on Kube. Um, recently, um, as I mentioned earlier from that pull request, uh, we submitted a, a formal charter for uh, SIGBIG data, and um, it's currently up. Uh, you can see the QR code will take you to that URL. Um, and so far, the main feedback we've had is that uh, Kubernetes governance uh, officially defines a SIG as owning some component or subsystem of a Kubernetes. And um, as you can see from our description, um, we actually haven't owned code in that way for the SIG. And so um, we're currently with discussions with the uh, steering committee about what to do. Um, what could we do? We could acquire ownership of uh, some code. Um, we might recategorize ourselves as a, a Kubernetes working group or sub-project or possibly even um, a new kind of, you know, some new kind of user community that fits the description of what it is we're actually doing. Um, and then also even I discussed with uh, one of the other uh, steering committee members um, grandfathering the, uh, some of the older SIGs that never had this as well. So all these are possible options. We'll probably sort them out um, after all the dust settles in the new year. Um, and uh, we are continuing to, uh, meanwhile, reach out to people. So um, if you know of a user community or project, um, that wants to integrate better with Kube, uh, we'd be more than happy to have you guys attend um, and get in touch with us. And uh, there's our, our contact handles um, for just email and then on kubernetes.slack.com. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to you in the audience. Um, if you have any ideas for new communities to engage with or questions or feedback on the uh, Airflow and Spark or just the general future of SIG Big Data, um, please. Feel free. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Kathan. I work with Lyft. Uh, we've been working on the uh, Spark operator with Inan, and it's been it's been going great. Um, we will be, as you saw, you you mentioned Flink operators. Uh, some work going on on our side. And then there's some other stuff that we are actually doing that kind of replaces airflow for most of our cases. Um, but I think one of the other sides on big data that we, it, it does touch scheduling uh, a little bit, like six scheduling. So I don't really know where what ends and what starts because what happens is when you start running things at scale, they break, uh, as you mentioned, like you start apart and then it hangs about or the progress just slows down tremendously. And, and so I think uh, how should we probably, maybe it's it's like combining those two SIGs, if, if at all, or keeping this SIG and also including like batch scheduling in this, in this SIG might be useful because there are, it's not just job like a Kubernetes native jobs, right? Do you, like, for example, if I want to schedule a pod, what happens if I'm running at, at capacity? What should be the behavior of a Spark driver? Should it crash or should it, like, uh, continue on? In Currently it works, I think, but, uh, um, like, I think we need to think about that. That's Those are my, it's, like, not a feedback, but I don't know, it's an open question. <laughs> um, no, those are definitely open questions. Um, I mean, behavior of uh, behavior of certain categories, especially of Spark jobs, uh, like long-running streaming jobs, uh, restart policies, is still being actually debated. Um, and there's the concept of, I believe, uh, you know, working group specifically designed to go across SIG like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another possible direction we could take that. Um, but, uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, so for a Spark job, once the uh, job finish run, does the driver kind of terminate itself, 
or is it still kind of keep running? Um, you can actually configure that now. Mm -hmm. um, you can set it so that um, if things crash or you know once they terminate, the pods remain. So you can actually go back and inspect them. Um, its default behavior is um, basically the you know what like most pods when it's done it just goes away it gets collected. So what happens like uh, so the driver pod will always stay like you know so when, once the job completes the driver's pod would be there well, even though it's not taking compute resource but it's actually taking SAD resource. So but the executor pods are different. So uh, for example if the, uh, if one executor just finishes uh, successfully it will be gone it will actually be deleted. Uh, I mean driver so, pods. Uh, by default. I mean driver pods. Okay driver will always stay. Yeah. So I have to clean up myself. So so there's actually a new feature called TTL on, on pods, which will be uh, alpha in one thirteen. So you can actually use that to set a TTL. Like you know, so once the, the, the driver pod finishes, it will be gone after TTL expires. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So uh, if you actually use the operator, um, so the life cycle of the pod, uh, the driver pod will be. Uh, tied to the, the life cycle of your CR. So um, that might be easier to handle that, those kind of things. Thanks. OK, so I need, sorry. A uh, couple of questions. Um, I don't think you mentioned anything around um, data locality of Spark execution with HTFS data. Is that something you've looked at? That's a, that's a good question. So uh, we actually had that feature in, the, in our fork before we upstreamed uh, Spark, you know, the, so the, the schedule backend into the main Spark repo. So um, we, I think we still need to have that, especially, you know, given um, we now have, like, you know, uh, support for, for example, for secure HDFS, uh, Kerbal support. So HDFS is also one of the projects we've been engaging with. So that's really, I think that's really important. Um, yeah, that's something, um, well, even though, you know, it's not listed there, but that's something we also plan to, to getting to into the main Spark repo yeah. as well. Yeah. And then kind of related, mm -hmm. when you're um, using uh, local disks, local PVs, mm -hmm. to actually uh, hold your HDFS data, mm -hmm. um, are we at risk of getting in race conditions with potentially the hosts getting moved around faster that we can get replicas rebuilt? So each cloud provider has the right to move our VMs when they're doing um, stamp evacuation mm -hmm. and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And um, do, have we got the right integrations um, with each cloud provider to ensure that if we're asked to evict, that we can get our replicas rebuilt fast enough? So uh, first of all, um, we are not really like um, touching any of these things, like, you know, so like, for example, lock and persist and what, that's really up to the application developers. They choose like you know what kind of things they want to use. If they want to like you know attach um, a um, a local process volume to their their jobs, they can do that. But uh, so within Spark, we don't do anything special. Uh, no, 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 Spark. We, we, uh, HDFS replication. We've okay. been, you know, what we have done has been primarily platform neutral. So uh, mm -hmm. you know, if you talk about like provider specific, you know, I, we haven't really talked in that detail at all. Um, some of the upstream conversations have been. You know, more along the lines of, you know, Spark, Spark of course, has native, you know, just native the, the ability to <coughs> download data, you know, from a URI to direct yeah, executors and stuff like that. That's all fine, and, yeah. And there, um, it may not answer your use yeah. case, but a lot of the, you know, upstream um, feedback we've gotten is maybe we should just let it do that. Go to S3, you know. Um, right. So do we not do you, are you aware of customers that are actually running HDFS and relying on the, uh, the local PVs and HDFS replication for durability? So uh, the thing I'm aware of actually so we uh, so we actually have a Helm chart for for HDFS uh, yeah. that's based on um, I believe it's actually based on the uh, host pass volume uh, if I'm not uh, wrong. So uh, I think there's a plan to actually you know try out like a local persistent volume for for HDFS data nodes. But uh, that hasn't been done yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, the first question is: uh, 
if you uh, sub Spark submit a job, you can specify what's the executor memory you prefer, yes. like 20 GB. Yes. Next job, maybe I want, only want 10 GB. Uh, do they actually share the same pod, or is it going to be different container allocated? Um, right now, there's not a lot of fine-grained control for which of those will happen. Um, one of the reasons we actually um, implemented the ability to add customized uh, templates was because people wanted affinity control, um, which was, I think, Okay. Then, uh, uh, one more question, which is, uh, is there an equivalent of like a fair scheduler or a capacity scheduler in this new? That's a really good question. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have actually been talking to uh, um, SIG scheduling about that. So they have a project called Kubi Batch. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it or not. Like that's supposed to be, you know, doing gun scheduling. Um, but Spark is actually pretty unique in the sense that. Um, you, the driver and executor, they don't start at the same time. They're not like, you know, uh, um, the same. They're not the same. They, so you can't relate that you treat them as the same group. So uh, the current, like, the Kubi batch uh, concept doesn't wor really work for uh, Spark, even though, you know, it w might work for machine learning uh, workloads, but not for Spark. So actually, I just had a, some discussion with the the lead on that project uh, earlier today. So um, I guess we will have some plan to actually see how we can make that work also work for Spark. And or generally, like you know, if you have a master worker kind of uh, architecture and the master and worker, they don't start at the same time, how you actually make that work for these kind of workloads as well. And also, it, um, so w w when it comes to scheduling, um, I think there's like, like uh, I see it's definitely you know, increasing demands for things like uh, the, you know, the capacity or for scheduler from Yarn, for example, in Kubernetes. Well, we don't currently have anything like those. So that's some, still something that we have to work on, so, yeah. Thanks. I got one more question. Mm -hmm. So is there any plan to do a kind of data catalog thing on Kubernetes, for example, something like AWS Glue or Hive, so you can, when I run Spark job, I can reference that metadata so even though I have many Spark jobs, so I have a kind of consistent, centralized metadata store, so I know where the data is coming from. Is there any plan for doing some sort of project like that? Um, we have no current plans, um, but if you'd like to see something like that, yeah, definitely, um, you know, send us an email, and we can, you know, try to get it in as part of our discussions, either on the SIG or upstream. Okay. Uh, so uh, it's basically like you know any custom resources. You basically just have your customer resource definitions stored somewhere, um, like you know. So you can either in, in YAML or you create those pro programmatically. Uh, there's like you know so di different ways of uh, doing that. Or you can act like you know, so you can also do like you know for example like C uh, Git uh, um, CI/CD kind of thing. Like you know you have your uh, specs uh, stored uh, on GitHub. For example, then uh, once you make a change, well, it will automatically trigger a redeploy, something like that. Yeah. So uh, it's just you know, so basic, just custom resources. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're at uh, just uh, just past five oh five. So oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> we can. No, yeah. if you've got yeah, more just, questions, yeah. we can and go. Think, uh, <laughs> we just gave it mm -hmm. I think the only question. Exactly. So I think one unique thing about this thing is actually it covers, you know, not only about compute but also storage yeah. uh, and scheduling. So um, there's a, like a whole bunch of things you have to consider when you run your data processing workloads on uh, Kubernetes. Um, yeah. So um, like what uh, you said, mm, yeah, that's a good idea. Actually, we can you know provide some yeah. kind of like reference uh, so people when people come to us, like you know, they know what would be the recommend 
tradition that we have when it is true. I mean, I think part of part of our mission is to supply like best practices. Yes, um, we have not codified that. It's been you know mostly just discussions recorded on minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to codify because you need also. Yeah, I mean my yeah. I mean, my my own view is that that's kind of application dependent. So I'm personally hesitant to like try to write some kind of comprehensive document on that. Maybe case studies. Yeah, actually, we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, some of it might actually want to reside now up on the Apache Spark docs, or for that matter, the Airflow docs. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to. We, there, it's not, it, there comes a point where we try to like make sure that like we're directing discussions to the right organization, because um, of course the upstreams want to make sure that like you know they're in the loop on anything that happens before it becomes a PR that shows up on their. Uh, <laughs> Thank Thanks, you, everybody. Guys.